Hello, everyone. My name is Roman Sidertsov, um, and um, I'm a senior uh, fellow um, for Energy Justice and Transitions at the University of Sussex. And um, I also a co-coordinator of uh, the project called Just North. Uh, and uh, if you are here, um, you um, uh, you are participating in a side event um, in which we will try to workshop ideas um, for uh, a uh, what we think is an intriguing tool, which is one of the cornerstones cornerstones of our project. Um, the uh, name of the session is Beyond ESG: Developing a Justice and Equity Based Tool for Sustainable Economic Development. And I'm here joined by my friend and my um, my colleague. Gustav Sigmund. So Gustav, could you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Roman. Uh, my name is Gustav Sigmund, and I'm a research advisor at uh, North University. I'm also the uh, project manager for Just North. Um, yeah, blah, blah, blah. So the format um, of our meeting today is as follows. Um, Gustav and I will um, say a few words about the project, um, about what we're trying to accomplish as a uh, as an EU-funded initiative. Um, we will then dive into the topic of today's workshop, which is the Just Score tool that we're trying to develop and how it might be. Uh, uh, a more specific um, and more uh, better, a better articulated, more applicable um, uh, tool than the concept of ESG. And then we would like to um, start working and have an actual in a dialogue. Um, uh, and we have prepared questions, which we would like to ask you, and we would like you to comment on. And uh, hopefully we can have uh, discussions, uh, a discussion based on uh, these questions. It is my understanding that the format of today's meeting is, um, is a bit different uh, than a typical Zoom gathering. Uh, so the, there are two platforms running simultaneously. They are connected, but there are two platforms. Um, uh, Gustav and I are, um, with the help uh, of the um, of the event organizer Andrei Kazakov, um, we are on Zoom and we can communicate through Zoom as well. And the feedback that we will be soliciting will be submitted through um, a different platform. So um, uh, we will be getting the questions uh, from the uh, the personnel, the hosts of this wonderful conference. Um, and we will be responding uh, and interacting that way. Um, anyhow, without further ado, why don't we start talking about um, our project uh, and what we are trying to accomplish. Just North by the numbers. What is this uh, project all about? Well, it is about, as I would like to say about people, um, uh, it's about uh, people being able to conduct research. Uh, it is part of the EU funded um, initiative, Horizon 2020, and more specifically, societal change of challenges, fighting and adapting to climate change. The uh, overall budget of this project is uh, around 6 million euros. We have 18 partners um, working together um, uh, over the direction, duration of the project, which is 42 months. Uh, we have 18 case studies um, um, that cover a very, very wide range of initiatives, including but not limited to mining, fisheries, shipping, tourism, traditional um, economies, and of course, energy, which is my area of expertise. Um, 70 researchers, 
Brown Cemetery Researchers have been involved in this project. So the project is, is quite massive. Um, the 18 case studies are not the only uh, research um, uh, components um, of, uh, of the overall design of this project. Um, uh, we have uh, a total of nine work packages, including uh, a work package um, that dove uh, quite deep into uh, uh, the uh, understanding of what justice is and how it relates to a more applied concept like ESG. Uh, we have 47 project deliverables um, uh, that do cover uh, the theoretical um, aspects of justice, conceptualizing um, and operation, operationalizing justice for uh, applied research, um, also uh, including uh, analysis of sustainability, policy and regulatory frameworks. Uh, and we have three project outcomes. Uh, we have a project documentary on which uh, we're currently working. Uh, we have a set of policy recommendations and the just score negotiation tool, which is very much the centerpiece of today's conversation. Um, so what are the ambitions of our, uh, of our project and what are our objectives? Um, we uh, started this project with um, trying to challenge the conventional um, notions of uh, viability of what actually means um, to uh, uh, what, 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 what does it mean to call a project a viable project um, uh, from the economic decision making? Uh, and to really try to rethink what it means in the context of sustainable development. We're also trying to um, bring social science expertise and interdisciplinary analysis to really show um, between the, the interplay between the uh, current pathways and really try to figure out pathways and try to, to um, to flesh out pathways towards <clears throat> sustainable futures uh, based on the views and values of um, stakeholders uh, that they have towards uh, development, economic development in the Arctic. Um, uh, we um, are heavily uh, leaning on <clears throat> the theories of justice um, and forms of justice. Um, we are incorporating uh, forms of justice, um, such as distributional, procedural, uh, substantive, uh, recognitional, and attributional, um, uh, to um, really move towards and uh, try to come up with principle um, um, of justice in the context of what we're studying. Um, and we are using the principles of responsibility, recognition, and universality in our work. All right, now let's uh, move into the meat, so to speak, of today's session and uh, the uh, juxtaposing this to uh, concept ESG uh, uh, and justice. Let's start with ESG. Well, first of all, what is ESG for those of you who are not familiar with this. Uh, ESG stands for three things. Uh, it stands for environmental, social, and governance. So, and ESG really is a rather um, modern or, uh, or, or, or uh, recently emerged concept, um, at least uh, the way it has been abbreviated with these three letters. Um, and E stands for environment, which environmental, which refers to the impacts um, that a company, a project, um, an initiative um, is going to have, has, and is going to have um, uh, in the in the course of its activities. Uh, and uh, uh, this helps investors to understand where sort of these impacts are and uh, 
move beyond just you know simple uh, dollars and cents or euros or cents or uh, pounds and pennies um, and really um, take a much more um, holistic view on the impacts of a project. So the other pillar of uh, ESG is social and it refers to the social impacts um, of a project uh, or activity or an initiative um, that um, investors also would like to pay attention to. Uh, and this impacts uh, often include gender issues. Um, uh, they include um, uh, racial issues, uh, racial justice and equity issues, and so forth. And the third pillar of ESG is governance. It really refers to how this impacts whether a, a company um, uh, has the ability to really work with um, uh, with its internal corporate corporate governance to um, really um, take these considerations into account, environmental and social. So, what are the uh, advantages, in my view, of or pluses of um, this concept? It has been defined. You know, it has three letters. You know, it has been abbreviated. So. Um, um, everyone or a lot of people who work in the on the economic development they have heard at least about this concept um, it can be operationalized because it has three components right so you can create a checklist if you are a company and design an internal company policy based on that um, and to a certain extent it can be explained um, and generalized so what are the minuses um, uh, in my view, it really lacks conceptual grounding, so it's not really well connected to the theories of justice. For example, the forms of justice, um, it is susceptible for abuse um, uh, because greenwashing is a real thing. Um, and uh, if you know there is a checklist and the checklist is complied with, regardless if the checklist actually has um, any meaning, um, a company can surely claim and put in its quarterly report that the ESG component has been met. Uh, and there is another side of that, um, of, that uh, of that problem. And that side uh, is the stakeholder and right holder resentment that usually follows something that is not really um, happening, something that is not, um, uh, has something that doesn't really have a meaning. Um, and uh, ESG, it has originated from the investor community and from the industry. It is mostly by and for the industry. So in contrast, um, justice is really hard to define. We really tried in this project and we, had really smart people working on it. And the problem with uh, defining justice is that um, it is what's in academia known as it's a very normative um, uh, concept or has a very, very large normative side. So if it has a very large normative side, then, then justice is defined of what one ought to do. So, and what one ought to do, there is no such thing as um, a universal definition of what one ought or not to or not to do. Um, however, it is an essential and fundamental concept. It's essential to the existence of humankind, um, but it's too personal. It's too personal and on the academia side, it's too academic. So, um, However, justice is for and by everyone, not just by uh, the industry and uh, for the industry. So what is this just score all about and why we're trying to move beyond ESG? So our ambition with just score is to operationalize justice in the context of economic development. So try to make it accessible, try to make it useful, try to make it measurable, try to make it uh, valuable and essential part of the actual process of economic development. Uh, the premise upon which we operate is that 
Any economic activity cannot be sustainable if it's viewed as ethically deficient by stake or right holders. It will simply not sustain. If a project is pushed on the community, that there uh, might be or likely be a conflict that will end that project, that will end that activity. Therefore, it will not be sustainable. Um, where does it come from, uh, the opposition, whatnot? Simply because stake and right holders put different values on different aspects of economic activity or project. And those values, they really do reflect um, their various, their divergent perceptions of justice. Um, the current approaches, and many of you have heard and, and or been part of this approach is, you know, consultation um, or, you know, a survey, community survey or some kind of a public hearing when um, uh, often uh, the, the proponent of an economic activity is not even uh, required to respond or not required to respond straight away to any kind of concerns. You know, we do not view them as uh, trouble free. We actually view them as uh, problematic because uh, they do not really attempt to um, uh, to really facilitate the project, uh, to facilitate the process of trying to um, come up with a mutually acceptable arrangement. So the just score tool um, is the way we envision it is something that will help to facilitate the evaluation and or negotiation process that um, hopefully will be able to either um, lead uh, various right and stakeholders to a mutually acceptable arrangement, or um, it will provide an early indicator, an early warning that um, there is a very, very low likelihood for any kind of um, uh, mutually acceptable uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, now, we do have our vision of the tool, and I'm going to turn to my colleague Gustav to tell you a little anecdote of um, how uh, the project and how the vision of the tool or the process of how vision of the tool has emerged. Um, uh, but uh, the point of this meeting is really not for us to inform you about, about this tool, but hopefully uh, work together to, um, to start talking about this tool. And really our ambition is to not follow what we have conceived and think is right, but really um, what we can co-produce with a very wide um, array of, of people, actors, stakeholders, and right holders. Gustav, tell us the anecdote. Thank you, Roman. Um, well, I just keep coming back to um, one time when I was talking to Roman and uh, Corinne Wood Donnelly, who is the um, scientific coordinator of the project. And uh, they started to talk about you know, this um, tool, which is called Just Score. And I was very curious to understand what is, what is this tool and what is behind it and why would anyone need this? And what I came to understand is that when large multinational corporations are planning vast uh, infrastructure projects uh, in the Arctic, for instance, um, there is an inequality when it comes to access to resources, knowledge, money, um, infrastructure between these corporations, governments, and also local uh, communities that everyone doesn't have the same access to information. Um, so the idea behind Just For, Just For Tool is to try to correct this in imbalance um, and create an equal balance by making information about infrastructure projects and their potential impacts um, available to everyone that might be impacted by it. So that we are trying to create um, a more transparent process 
by facilitating contacts and dialogue between the main stakeholders and the white partners in this area, and to make um, the concept of justice more concrete and more practical, like Roman was talking about. Um, so the idea behind the Just War tool is to create this layer of information that everyone can really understand and benefit from. And this will facilitate dialogue and co-production, uh, real co-production uh, between the main stakeholders. Um, and it is our hope that this tool uh, will lay the foundation for European policy making in this area. So whenever large uh, infrastructure projects are being planned in, in the European Arctic, that this tool would actually be taken into use uh, by the main actors. And we are also in contact with the European External Action Service, which is like the foreign office of the EU, uh, to involve them in this process to make sure that this is also kind of tapping into the mechanics of European policy making. So what we are doing today in this workshop might actually influence the way that the EU is thinking and organizing uh, their work around infrastructure funding. Uh, and, um, and that's quite powerful, I think, not least when we're thinking about the fight of climate change in the future. So what we're doing here really matters to the rest of Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Gustav. And I think you failed to mention that the uh, uh, the original sketch of just score was conceived on a napkin. And now that napkin is located in a very, very secret location. So anyhow, um, on that note, I think we um, uh, have exhausted our talking points. And we, we really would like to ask you questions and help us to um, develop or co-develop this uh, this tool. Uh, and I would like to start with question number one. And it's my understanding that uh, the, uh, the questions are submitted uh, online. We cannot see you, you can only see us. Um, um, they uh, can be submitted online via different platforms. So please uh, type your answers. Uh, and please also identify uh, yourself so we know where it came from um, and we can actually say um, so-and-so says and whatnot. So we have prepared five questions that are fundamental for, the, uh, for this tool. And uh, we would really, 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 really would like your responses. And um, what we were hoping to achieve um, is more of a dialogue here. So although we are going to have, even though we are going to have a bit of a lag um, in the dialogue, um, what we would like to do is uh, to start with asking a question, maybe then taking three first responses and then um, asking for counter responses. And maybe this is how we can um, try, to, um, uh, try to have a dialogue here. So the first question, you probably have seen it for quite a bit on your screens. Uh, what problems tend to arise when stakeholders and right holders with competing interests negotiate in development projects? Um, please, um, let's take a minute uh, and please, um, I would greatly appreciate if you could um, type um, uh, your answer to uh, these questions. I wish I had a music, um, uh, like a game show music, so we can actually do the little clock. Uh, but um, it is uh, uh, 27 minutes past the hour. Uh, and uh, when it's uh, about a minute from now on, I will, um, I will ask to, um, we will turn to uh, actually reading the questions.
All right, so we have the first response. And it's a good one. It would be great to have a little more. Gustav, if you don't mind, I will read the response. Yes, um, it says in Norway, one main issue is how economic development comes to interplay with indigenous rights and traditional activities. For instance, the Sami people have for a few years now been talking about green colonialism when green industrial development takes place in traditional areas. How do you envision economic development interacting with indigenous activities in the years to come, especially now that the EU is quite interested in Sami issues? It's a great question. It is a great question indeed. And we have not just one, but two case studies that are looking into this kind of issues. Um, uh, it's how do we envision? we envision hopefully um, an attempt to, uh, well, a much, not just um, quantitatively different uh, engagement of the EU um, with, the, with the, um, the Sami people, but also qualitatively different and not just um, the Sami people, but also with, um, um, other local and indigenous communities in the Arctic. And that is uh, why we're essentially here. Um, and the qualitative the different issue is that um, there is a recognition that there is a, uh, a value and ethics system or systems um, that um, indigenous people have developed over millennia. And those uh, value and stakeholder uh, and the value and ethics systems, they are different than what we in the West view as Western ethics. And the justice perceptions based on the value and ethics systems um, are incorporated in the decision-making process. So um, a great comment, and I actually have a reply, and I would like um, the, the person who posted um, this or were the, uh, the, the author of this, of this comment, uh, maybe try to say, what is, the, uh, what is your, uh, how would you go about reconciling um, two divergent uh, standpoints. One comes from, say, central government and another um, uh, perspective comes from the Sami people. What would be, um, say, the process through which a disagreement can be resolved? So while um, you're hopefully responding to the stool. Um, Gustav, should we go to the next um, comment? Yes. Um, the two attempts to identify and balance the different values of stakeholders. What about the creation of new values? That's a, that's a great, great uh, question um, because values are changing and it's very clear that there is a clash of values um, uh, that needs to uh, be taken into account when we are designing a tool like this. Um, and one can also imagine that the process of negotiating the different interests will also lead to um, the development of new values. 
um, where the kind of consumerist approach that has been uh, quite visible in the Western world up until now uh, might be mitigated by a more uh, environmentally uh, um, responsible approach um, where, where life quality can be uh, taken into account in a different way. All right, so um, should we make, uh, should we move into the next? Yeah, there was a question about barriers of adoption and how will they be addressed? You want to All right, would you like to take this one? Hmm. Would you like to respond to that? Uh, yeah, uh, so let, let, well, let me, you know, um, we, recently, we just had a uh, workshop um where we really try to reconcile um uh, not uh, various stakeholder views on this tool but really our own because we were given an assignment to go and essentially think about it for a long time so and the um it was interesting that um our team um that includes um uh, academics who have some um, uh, experience outside academia, but also come from divergent fields. Um, we all have identified various barriers. Um, so some of the barriers, you know, and my background is mostly in law. Uh, and I started thinking about it as the barriers um, related to really trying to change the legal mechanisms through which the tool can be applied. Um, somebody um, uh, noted the, um, the cultural issues and the power imbalance. And there is actually a question about like, um, uh, you know, what about, what about the power imbalances that do exist um, uh, when in the context of uh, an industrial project? So um, one of the, um, uh, what we're trying to achieve is that we're trying to come up with the, you know, with the, with the barriers. We, we're trying to identify as many barriers as we can um, and, um, uh, and, uh, essentially try to calibrate the tool that it recognizes that there will be inherent barriers. That it was not something that was not designed in a government office in Oslo. Something was designed um, in SAPMI, something that was designed in Greenland, in Southern Greenland, something that was designed uh, in Northern Finland, something that was designed with uh, people and with the input. So, um, uh, Gusta, why don't you pick the next response? Um, there was a good question about how it's improving on past mechanisms. And from my perspective, uh, I'm, I'm, I've been following European policy making for quite some years. And what I've come to understand is that uh, when the EU is designing policies uh, and also trying to understand their potential impact, uh, they have traditionally had quite a strong focus on the economic and environmental impacts of different policies. Um, but what hasn't been addressed uh, that we are trying to do in this project is the social impacts. And correct me if I'm wrong here, Roman, but uh, the fact that we see a growing number of um, legal disputes around um, investments in the Arctic uh, is mostly related to the social impact, which is kind of addressing um, traditional livelihoods in the Arctic. 
uh, and forcing people, usually minorities, to accept um, the majority rule in the in the common interest. Um, and we are hoping that the um, diaspora tool will help um, illustrate the, the a more holistic approach uh, to address also uh, the social impacts of European policies. Um, Roman, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, um, I'm actually going to continue. There's a, a, a group of three questions um, and or comments. Let's just call them comments, right? So because we, we actually want you to tell us what the concerns might be, um, what, you know, and um, we would would like to learn from you as much um, as we would like to answer your questions. So please um, 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 phrase your questions. No, we normally hear the phrase your questions in the form of a question. So uh, phrase your question in the form of a comment. <laughs> you've never heard that before. This is the first time you've heard it. Um, so, but anyhow, so three comments that I would like to um, elaborate, elaborate on a bit. Um, and uh, these uh, comments, they are uh, concerned with the types of se sectors that the tool will um, try to cover, uh, um, the fact that there are um, uh, the issue um, that uh, the policies um, that are made, they're made somewhere in central offices, um, central government offices, uh, pick your favorite or least favorite um, um, capital where those things made. And also the, uh, the comment upon which I, I've already uh, touched um, about uh, the uh, power dynamics. Um, so what we are trying to do with, with this tool Right, so this tool is not going to solve all the problems. But what we're trying to do is that we try to create um, a mechanism um, that recognizes that there is a power imbalance, an inherent power imbalance, um, whether it is between a large, say, multinational corporation uh, and a local, small local community, um, or it is between a large multinational corporation and uh, a local government, or it is between the central government and the local government, right? So, but the, the tool um, will uh, make sure that, um, that is on display, right? So the, um, if there is a concern by the local community, that concern is articulated. It is articulated and there is an explanation of why it is articulated, why, why the concern is. Not just that why, what the concern is, but why the concern exists, right? So, and the way we at least envision it is that if there is um, a process through which all these concerns are documented and the explanations for these concerns is provided um, and there is a clear indicator where the parties of the entire, um, in, in, in the context of the entire project uh, or activity, um, they, they stand, there is a better understanding of um, these underlying issues. Um, so if it's clearly um, brought um, up uh, by, you know, one set of, uh, of an issue is clearly brought up by one set of stake and right holders and another issue brought up, you know, that is in, in the no, that is in the clear. Um, so uh, in terms of what sectors, you know, we do think this is a very much of a contextual tool. So it will be in the context of a particular uh, development of a particular activity. So it can be applied um, 
you know, essentially to any activity, you know, maybe, you know, there can be exceptions made. Um, and, you know, frankly, I'm not willing to even think about it yet because we are at the um, very infancy of this project. Maybe there's some exceptions, you know, based on national security or something like that, right? So, so that, I mean, that would exclude um, some military installations or projects, but I mean, that is very much, you know, in the future, those kind of concerns. And um, our main goal is to make sure that the, the core of the tool is developed. So, um, so yeah, so that's sort of what we're trying to do. I don't know if, um, if this is too vague of, a, of an answer, but we do believe that um, uh, the transparency of the um, of the process and the fact that not a single stakeholder um, or actor controls the agenda is what really will help with uh, inclusivity and inclusivity uh, leads to a greater recognition of um, the communities and people who have not been recognized and actors that have not been recognized. And that leads to a greater recognition of issues that um, these uh, communities and people are concerned about and actors are concerned about. Um, and if it is out in the open, it is out in the open. So it also increases the transparency. So um, we have um, now, uh, we have, uh, we're going from the last comment. Um, Gustav, why don't you take this one and we'll move to another question. I think it was uh, Apostolos uh, who had a question about uh, a more region-wise development policy in the years to come. Uh, Apostolos, do you wanna share, uh, expand a bit? Uh, Gustav, he, uh, Apostolos, um, actually he takes the questions online from um, oh, online. Okay. And then he posts them. So that's why they either come from Elise or Apostolos, so, who, to whom we're very grateful. So thank you, Apostolos and Elise, for, for doing this um, for us. So there's one question, the last question. If this tool and I think has been tested in a practical yeah. setting. And the answer is? You tell me. No. It hasn't been so, and the reason why it hasn't been is because we're trying to develop and we're trying to develop with the feedback that we get from bright people like you are. So, but um, uh, our plan includes um, actually a simulation of the tool. So there are various steps in the tool development and uh, the very last um, uh, step uh, as part of this process, is to really um, um, do a simulation, a uh, full-blown simulation, um, and see if it works or doesn't work. All right, so I'm moving to the next question. So please, we really want your feedback on what tools, techniques, or strategies are currently used to negotiate development project and how do these tools tend to fail? I've already alluded to some. Um, it would be great if you could give us an idea of which ones um, are you aware of and how well they do? We are going to take a minute. Do we get any responses? Hmm. I don't see any.
All right, we have the first one. Okay, I'm going to read this one. When it comes to indigenous rights activities, consultations are successfully taking place in most cases throughout North Norway, but when it comes to Friar Fpik, uh, there is definitely a gap. Um, I was wondering to um, the person who uh, uh, submitted this, um, what kind of gap can you, um, if possible, could you please elaborate on, on that particular gap? Because this is, this is very, very, very interesting. And more responses, please. As we're hopefully getting there with more responses, um, uh, I just want to note my observation. Um, when we first started thinking about, or at least some of us started thinking about this, and you know, and I'm, I've been cursed because um, uh, of my legal background, um, so I always think about it whether there is a legal mechanism for doing whatever needs to be done, uh, whether it's a consultation, whether there's some kind of a engagement with um, uh, with people and communities that will get impacted. I immediately look into, um, go and do some, and read something really, really boring, right? So it's some kind of a, um, a, um, a statute or regulation, administrative regulation regarding uh, environmental impact assessment, social impact assessment, whatnot. Um, so um, when we were, um, uh, when, when, when we were thinking about where, like what, where does this tool fit? I started thinking about whether it can actually be uh, incorporated as part of the existing mechanisms. And um, I think it can uh, to a certain extent uh, because a lot of those mechanisms, they really do not specify the mechanics. You know, they just call it, you know, it's a consultation or it's a public meeting, but um, there is really, um, in many cases, not a specific prohibition on how the process actually occurs. So um, we envision this to be um, a process that is facilitated by a, perhaps a third party that has absolutely no attachment or stake um, in the process that is not, does not come from say the central government or not, but just simply there to facilitate the process. Just think about it as a mediator in the context of um, uh, a court proceeding, right? So if it's an outside the court, you have an, uh, a mediator that essentially facilitates the process, right? So um, the really this tool is really about the how the process takes place. And as long it is within the, uh, does not contradict anything in the enabling legislation or directly um, in the implementing regulation, then it should be fine. Uh, plus, we were thinking also that there is an opportunity for private um, action when um, a company wants to do something um, uh, that goes beyond what the law requires and that would be very much in line with the g in the um, in the asg right so there's also um, an opportunity for that so we get two new messages um gusta um, read them aloud Elise says that from personal experience the kind of community meetings action uh, voluntarily by companies in natural resource projects are not seen as inclusive by the community. Project stakeholders tend to maybe approach a single representative from the community 
that isn't necessarily seen as representing the community in practice. So even though that one representative might agree to, with the terms and conditions of the project, the project stakeholders are then often surprised when the project faces community backlash later on. Consultations is often not considered as sufficient by communities involved in natural resource development. What about consent and more importantly, compensation? That's a very legit comment. Thank it's you. thank you. Thank you very much for who um, ever posted this comment. Uh, it confirms where what we've identified as a as a failure of the current processes, but it also specifies what exactly is wrong. So thank you very much. So there's another comment. I'm going to read it if you don't mind, and then we're going to move to question number three. Um, there's definitely a regulatory gap when it comes to Norway's commitment towards international law instruments as well as domestic legislation. Um, and a general reluctance from policymakers to operationalize such an instrument. Thank you. This is also um, a fantastic comment. Um, thank you for that. This is very important for us to have this, this feedback. All right, so are we ready to move on question three? Um, one, two, three, we're moving to question number three. I'm going to read it. How might a new negotiation to help stakeholders and right holders to solve or better address these problems. So this is a sneakily um, difficult question to ask. And a lot of comments were asking us how we see um, the tool. And now let us ask you, if you were in our shoes and you're trying to design something, um, how do you see how it might what, what would be sort of on the, uh, on your aspirations list? Like, what, what do you think, what do you think might, uh, can actually work? So let's take a minute and we would love, would absolutely love some ideas from you. All right, so we have a first comment. I'm gonna take this one. Um, Gustav, please be on the lookout for the next one. Uh, um, I would rather ask you, what do you mean by negotiation tool? A legally binding tool could always promote interest of different stakeholders. Um, for example, great comment. Um, so then there is a question, you know, let me start with the uh, second part of this comment. Uh, a legally binding tool um, could always promote interest of um, different stakeholders, for example, right? So in a way, the way at least I see the problem with the, the status quo is that there are uh, tools that promote uh, wittingly or unwittingly interests of some stakeholder. Uh, because, you know, a company can be a stakeholder as well. You know, a government, a national government can be a stakeholder as well. I mean, they have a stake in the project, right? Or in, in an activity. So, and also uh, a tip of, of, of a cap, which I'm not wearing. Sorry for not wearing a cap. Um, um, to the comment about power imbalances. So um, in our view, um, it is a very uh, delicate 
balance between um, making something or you know building something into the tool that would promote interest of or would would, would uh, promote interest of one stakeholder group over another. Um, and we're grappling with that. Um, should there be um, some kind of a um, mechanism that would account uh, would account for power imbalances and um, thereby give some kind of a leverage to one one group or uh, stakeholder group or another? So um, and I, you know frankly I don't know the answer to it um, based on the on the, on the status quo experience, this might not be a good idea. So um, at least my, uh, my personal preference is to try to explore um, really the, um, the power of transparency. Um, uh, what uh, is described in academia as the targeted transparency when you essentially make, uh, when you identify um, um, each position um, and not just identify the position that has been articulated, but also the position that is yet to be articulated, is yet to be fully fleshed out. Um, uh, a, a, the kind of transparency that doesn't only show what's what's in there, but also makes it explicit what's not out there, whose uh, who's, um, um, uh, viewpoint, whose perspective is not part of the common process. Um, so uh, very quickly to the first um, bit of the, of, the, of the question is, uh, what do you mean by negotiation tool? So um, our first um, um, sort of a hunch was to create a tool that would facilitate a dialogue a negotiation process. Um, and the more we thought about it, and the more of a feedback we got from our researchers who are not part of this particular group, the more we realized that just scores cannot, it, that doesn't need to be exclusively a negotiation tool. As a matter of fact, um, we might even question you know, its value in the actual negotiation process. Maybe it becomes a facilitation tool for assessments and or negotiations. So it's not, you know, not, and this kind of feedback is precisely what we need to, um, to really figure out what, what the best use is. So, but the idea at least initially was that there is a tool that helps people to be engaged in meaningful dialogues and highlight the instances in which this dialogue does not occur. Um, there is a, an asterisk to that. Um, and this asterisk, I know I started thinking about it again because I've been cursed by um, uh, having not, not one, but three law degrees, um, is that the uh, for for a long while, for for example, mediation was seen as um, this really miracle cure uh, for clogging up a judicial system and uh, giving the parties um, uh, an opportunity to figure things out and whatnot. Um, and uh, then there was a backlash. And the backlash came from the fact that, uh, well, um, it's supposed to be theoretically a um, an evenly sort of balanced process, uh, a mediation, right? So, but in reality, you can see abuses uh, and you can see biases from mediators, from um, whoever facilitates this, what's known as alternative dispute resolution. Uh, and um, sometimes there were compromises made for the sake of compromises. And what I've learned is that, you know, they're 
not in every instance, uh, there not in every instance a compromise can be achieved. Uh, some kind of a mutually acceptable arrangement can be and should be achieved. So, and this is what we're trying to figure out to what extent the tool um, accounts for that, enables to um, put up a red flag and say, uh uh, there's the, the issue is so important, the issue is so, the, the parties are so far ahead that um, there is absolutely no way that, uh, or there shouldn't be a way in which this part is reconciled. Okay, good stuff. I've been talking for way too long. Why don't you take the next? Okay. Um, I was just thinking about this. Uh, the, the question is how to define a negotiation tool. And here, we are really asking you to present with us your kind of wish list of what you think you would need to be better prepared to negotiate a, an investment of, of some kind. So one might think of a negotiation tool like a checklist uh, with critical questions that needs to be answered. But one might also be thinking in terms of scenarios, like suppose we would build this mine, um, what would the long-term implications be for the local communities and also other actors that are further away? And I'm also kind of thinking about the last question that came in about um, uh, a tool that could go beyond national jurisdictions. And I really think that both the consortium behind the project, but also the EU is very interested in developing a tool that could go beyond uh, since um, not least climate change is such a global trend uh, where national boundaries simply are inadequate to, to address that. Um, coming up with a tool that can facilitate uh, uh, dialogue beyond the, the nation state is very welcome. Um, so any, any kind of strong feelings you might have about what a tool should uh, be able to do is very welcome, I think. All right, thank you, Gustav. I think we're gonna move on to more specific questions that we have for you. And again, um, we really, really do appreciate this feedback. We really do. So the more, the merrier. Um, so please don't be shy and tell us, tell us what to do. Question number four, what about negotiation process? Should we keep in mind to ensure this tool is designed successfully? Please. Tell us what to do. Or what not to do? While we're waiting, Gustav, do you know um, um, an appropriate joke? So we can about the this. negotiation process, as you mean. Any any joke that will um, that will be right for this occasion. I'm too curious to find out what what ideas 
that might come up. Uh, those comments, perhaps that they are not linear and official processes are not always the main slash only venue for agreement. Informal components are also important. The informal processes are also important. Thank you. That's very true. Well, it's, you know, it really is unfortunate that we can't like just chat in real time. I'm just, um, um, I was wondering if you could give us an exam uh, examples um, of informal components. I'm just, I'm just curious. I'm, I'm a very much of a, a person who learns by example. Um, maybe that's why, or, um, I like philosophy so much because there's always an example. There's always a hypothetical. Um, and any other ideas, please. We, we would love to hear them. I can imagine that uh, I'm thinking of narratives created about the problem, like in the media. Right. Well, that is that is very interesting. Um, I mean, um, the formality of the process, and maybe that is one of the barriers as well. That there is when there is a, a formal process, there's a formality. There's a formal element of a process uh, that can be discouraging. As a matter of fact, uh, one of our one of my colleagues who is working on Just Scores, Just Score with me, described that. Well, for example, when you are doing your research in Greenland, they um, they take they take their um, their time, you know, um, getting to know the community, getting to know the people. Uh, there's an important, there's a, a, a great importance of what, what we call a small talk. Uh, when you talk about, you know, the weather, um, um, about, I don't know, uh, petrol prices, those kind of things, before you move on to a much uh, more in-depth uh, conversations. So, um, and describing um, um, so I think uh, Roman there was just uh, another uh, comment uh, uh -huh. where there was an example of a wind farm in Norway that was officially agreed upon for the go-ahead by the municipal government um, uh, after a local vote, but the post-construction backlash by the indigenous community came as a big surprise to the companies involved. The vote went ahead without considering that not all of the people affected by the development uh, and the loss of land actually did not live in the official jurisdiction covered by the vote. Yeah. And of course, there's quite a wide literature about uh, green colonialism, um, where this narrative really fits nicely into. Um, and there are so many examples similar to this, which is really unfortunate. Um, and when I'm thinking about the, um, the EU, the Green Deal, um, where um, Franz Timmermans, the vice president of the European Commission, is saying that the Green Deal builds on that we shouldn't leave anyone behind. Having a comprehensive dialogue with um, 
local communities is really important. Absolutely. Well, why don't we move to the last question? Um, all right. So under what circumstances, and maybe we can build on the uh, on the last comment that was made, under what circumstances do you see stakeholders and right holders benefiting from or being disadvantaged by um, our negotiation tool? So let's, you know, let's continue if, if, if we can with the wind farm For example. All right, so um, um, maybe a specific um, sector, um, maybe a specific location, specific region of the Arctic where this might not be appropriate, um, those kind of things. I think it's, uh, I'm just thinking uh, quite openly here that uh, uh, when you are planning large infrastructure projects, dealing with energy, for instance, um, there is a broad general interest that is behind the project. Uh, and one important circumstance would be to protect um, minorities and minority rights when we're dealing with uh, these kind of large, large investments. Um, so the rule of law, for instance, how can we ensure the principle of rule of law So a couple of comments. Um, so a small scale, you know, definitely in, you know, we're already thinking about the small scale. So here's another one. Um, I'm thinking of places where these negotiations have to be conducted remotely or where the use of gatekeepers often from government or artificial interests, but then local voices from having a say yeah um so um this is this is good to know um because we were hoping that this will really open things up 
um, in the circumstances that are uh, for for the context in which there is a clear disregard um, for the local voices. Um, so one example keeps in mind, and this example comes from Russia. Um, I have um, quite a few colleagues who are anthropologists, and um, a lot of them work in Russia. Um, and it was interesting to hear from them um, sort of the reflections of the locals on any kind of a consultation process, that it's really, um, there's absolutely no regard um, from whoever, whoever facilitates the process for where the people are, what are they doing, what time of the year it is and whatnot. So that is why you have any kind of a public meeting that is just um, either not well attended or it's staffed by people who work, you know, by a local library or something. Um, and there's really no meaningful solicitation of even concerns that are uh, that do uh, that are uh, present, right? So, um, so one more um, message, and I think we can we can wrap, uh, wrap up, Gustav. Certainly, there is there is space for community engagement, local development, procedural and participatory rights and issues. It will be pushed toward better communication between state and local authorities. Um, and I, I do think um, that is that is sort of the, one of the side benefits of what we're trying to do. That it's also a learning tool, and there are various ways in which we envision this to become a learning tool. Um, and uh, I'm not ready to sort of report on what we are really, um, what, what we're thinking in, in, in all of these aspects of what this tool can be in terms of learning, right? So, but one aspect, I think you, you absolutely nailed um, that because of the transparent nature and because of sort of the um, maybe the the less official flavor or 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 nature of this of this project. It's also an ability for the central governments and, frankly, by by all the proponents of of a particular activity or particular project to learn about potential pitfalls. I mean. Um, I've seen so many projects, energy projects, because this is my area, being absolutely derailed, absolutely derailed by essentially trying to ram it um, wherever it, you know, they're supposed to go. And there's so much resentment and there's so much conflict and there's so much local resistance, then at some point, um, a company just gives up. And for very, very, very good reason. They really shouldn't be there. They really shouldn't be doing uh, the project that they're doing, which doesn't mean that they can be doing a different project or project that uh, mitigates some of the concerns that the local community has, or it's done in a way where um, there is a consent, there is an agreement um, on what, on, on sort of the rough um, outline of what this project will and will not do. Um, and that comes from an honest dialogue, a transparent dialogue. And this is what we are trying to create um, as part of this tool. Um, and if, and again, sort of, I would like to emphasize this, this point that, um, not every single project should go ahead. And um, the consequences of not realizing that and accepting that are often expressed in millions of euros. Uh, and for certain activities in billions of euros um, of lost opportunities of projects that just never take off um, and whatnot, right? So I think this is this is very, very important um, for for the tool to account for that as well. 
So um, I think we are nearly out of time uh, for whoever is um, still attending um, this session. We would like to thank you for all your participations. I really would like to thank Kalis and Apostolos. Um, Apostolos, I think it's Apostolos. Um, and Apostolos, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, for your tremendous work and for your tremendous help. If you would like to learn more about the project, where we're going, um, what are we trying to do, uh, the publications that are coming out of these projects and, and opportunities to get involved, um, this is how you can find us. You can find us uh, our um, personal contact information as well. So please do get in touch and um, we would love to would love to connect and would love to uh, continue um, having this conversation. So um, again, um, thank you very much to Andre Apostolos and um, Elise. Thank you very much, Gustav, for uh, um, doing this with me. And I think um, uh, we can wrap up. So correct me if I'm wrong. I can just stop sharing this, say goodbye to everyone and end. So um, permission to end, Gustav. Thank you. All right. Thank you everyone and goodbye.